going to get started with a California Zephyr Seminar, um, one of many that we've had here. This one is going to differ uh, slightly in that we decided or we elected to come out with a complete California Zephyr train set. Make sure in your packet you have the following items. Uh, the history of the California Zephyr, make sure you have that. Okay, great. You should also have in your packet a graphic uh, picture like so. Uh, one shows, this is a um, CB and Q, it's the Golden Spike Club version of a 12 car set, so that should be in there. You should have a order form that looks like this. It says at the top, uh, Golden Spike Club California Zephyr CB and Q set. That's going to explain to you the cars that are within this set and what the price is. Then you should have a dealer brochure that looks like this. It actually says California Zephyr Passenger. Uh, commemorative edition, so make sure you have that, that's the dealer set. Then you should have another graphic, someone just came in Pat, okay, that has uh, two sets of locomotives at the top, would be the Western Pacifics and the Denver Rio Grande. You see that one? Okay, good. And then there should be um, a page explaining the Silver Rapids, and then immediately underneath the Silver Rapids should be another that explains the Silver Solarium, okay. and then finally there should be a, um, not finally, but there should be a complimentary Golden Spike Club newsletter that would look like that on the front. And then if you're uh, not a Golden Spike Club uh, member, um, this is an application to become a Golden Spike Club member. It's $30 as a basic membership. $65 will give you the club car, which this year is a Canadian National 40-foot aluminum car. They had four of these things that were actually in revenue service, and they have two different uh, paint schemes on each side of the, of the car. So that should be everything within your packet. Now we've had, since we've announced the California Zephyr train set, there's been a tremendous amount of confusion over the difference between the Golden Spike Club 12 car set and a set that you can buy through a dealer. And I'm gonna say this to you right now. If you've ever wanted to own a premium passenger car set, don't pass this deal up. You're not gonna see it again. Not at this price point. It is absolutely a stunning deal on the behalf of Atlas. And I'm not saying that because of it worked for Atlas. I just know for a fact it's a stunning deal and you're probably not gonna see it again. And if you do see it again, it's gonna be at a much higher price point. Now, in total, what makes these sets very unique is that there's a total of 10 sets that you can order and they're all prototypically correct, meaning they mimic exactly what was on the rails from 1949 to 1970 for the California Zephyr. Nine of the sets are available from the dealers. Now, on your dealer brochure, if you look closely at that, we break it out for you, and that's where some of the confusion has developed. That's the one that says commemorative on the top. And if you go, just flip it on the back, and that sort of clears it all up for you. You'll see there are four car sets listed as A, B, and C. Everyone see that on the back, A, B, and C sets? Okay, those are four car sets that you can order, either individually, or you can do an eight car set, or you can do the full 12 car set. As long as you do a combination of any combination of an A, B, or C, you're prototypically correct for the Zephyr train set. So again, let me repeat that. Any combination of an A, B, or C four car pack 
will give you a prototypically 12 car correct California Zephyr. Now someone asked me what is the difference between the Golden Spike Club set and the dealer set. Well, we had to have something for the home team. So what we did is three of the cars within that set are, two of them actually are active as we speak. The Silver Solarium was actually rehabbed a few years ago after it left the California Zephyr service. It went to Amtrak, then a private owner got the car, and then it went into a state of disrepair. As a matter of fact, in the charter service who has the car now, found the car, there was mushrooms growing out of the seats and some tree limbs growing out of the windows. There was no dome windows in the car. The story, which I gave you on the Silver Solarium, explains what they did. It's back the way it was originally. It's got over 7 million miles on it. And by the way, all these cars were built locally. Philadelphia, they're called Bud cars, and they're incredibly strong. As a matter of fact, of the 77 cars that was purchased by the three railroads except one, so 76 cars, most all of them are still in service to this very day, or not in service, they're still around to this very day. So Silver Solarium is part of the Golden Spike Club set. The Silver Rapids, which is a very unique car, is still in service today. And here's what makes the Silver Rapids unique. When the train was announced, uh, in 1949. The inaugural run was on March 20th, 1949. The Pennsylvania Railroad wanted in on the action. So they went out and they first of all approached the three railroads that ran this train from Chicago to California, which was the Chicago, Clinton and Quincy, or CB and Q, the Denver, Rio Grande and Western, and the Western Pacific. Those were the three railroads that took the train from Chicago to California. Pennsylvania Railroad approached them and said, hey, look, how would you like to have coast-to-coast -coast service? You'll be able to offer coast-to-coast -coast service. Okay, what do you mean? Well, if you've got clientele that's getting on in California and they want to go all the way to New York City, how about we purchase a car and we allow them to do that without disembarking the car? So that's exactly what they did. They bought a car, they named it the Silver Rapids, and oh, by the way, it's got unique markings on it. There's only one PRR. If you look at the cars out here on this train, you'll see on each end of the car, it tells which railroad purchased the car. It will have cb and Q or Denver Rio Grande or Western Pacific on the ends of the cars. Pennsylvania Railroad Silver Rapids only had one insignia on one side, and it said PRR. That was it. And then, of course, the name Silver Rapids. That car stayed in service from 1949 to 1964, when that service basically went away. But the neat thing about it is if you were a well heeled passenger and you wanted to pay extra, you didn't have to leave that car once you got into Chicago. You could stay on it. They would disconnect the, they would switch it out from the train. Pennsylvania Railroad would pick it up, put it on one of their passenger trains and take you right on into New York City. Now here's another little known fact about that car. The uh, New York Central, who were, you know, diabolically um, a competitor of the Pennsylvania Railroad, they approached the Pennsylvania Railroad and said, we want in on that action too. How about we form a little partnership that when you can't take the train to New York City, we'll take it to New York City. And the Pennsylvania Railroad agreed to it. So both the Pennsylvania Railroad and the Western Pacific, and that's in your, the, the very first thing that I... Uh, told you to look for. That information is actually in this um, right here. It will tell you that those two railroads work together to make sure you could go from coast to coast without getting off the car. Now if the car was not available, the uh, New York Central would actually lease a car from the Denver Rio brand, a 10-6 sleeper, and that 10-6 sleeper was always the next to the last car. It was always plugged in just before the uh, dome observation lounge car. So it was easy to facilitate disconnecting the dome observation car, pulling that 10-6 sleeper off, and taking it to New York City. So uh, the other car that, as I said, is, or I didn't say, the Silver Lounge. That car is in Patola, California, as we speak, at the Western uh, Pacific Museum and it's in the process of being rehabbed. I didn't put information in there on it,
But if you uh, have access to a computer, just type in the Western Pacific Museum. You'll see passenger cars. You'll see a number of uh, California Zephyr passenger cars that they have. And it, they will give you the story on how they're rehabbing that car so that it will be back in service today. So that's what makes the Golden Spike Club set unique is those three cars along with, if you buy that set, you will get a numbered metal certificate from Atlas. As I explained on the dealer, now the only way you can get the Golden Spike Club set is 12 cars complete. There is no options like you can get on a dealer set. The dealer set, if the reason we broke it out this way, and believe me, it added crazy complexity to our ordering cycle. But the feeling was, we announced this train in 2009. The first car shipped in uh, 2010. So that's been a long time. Here we are in 2016 and we finally completed the train set. So we knew there was going to be a lot of people out there that had already collected a bunch of these cars. By offering four car sets, a prospective uh, person that's trying to put the set together that's been out there on the hunt, can now go and go, geez, those are the cars I'm missing. All I need is those two or that three or that four or that six and be able to go to a dealer and order them up. And a lot of dealers have already told us they will break up a four car set if someone comes in and let's say they want two of the four or three of the four, they'll break the four car set. So think about it for a moment. No one in Inscale, HO, or O has ever offered the California Zephyr with the flexibility that we're offering this set in. So another reason I say if it's in the budget and you want a great scale size passenger train set, don't even hesitate on this. Now you will notice on the order forms we break out the locomotives separately. Um, and all of the locomotives are powered and we've done that for a reason. We wanted this set to be unique so there is no dummies. The only dummies will be the person that's controlling the train, and I'm one of those. I wanted the Denver Rio Grands, and those are the only ones I don't have. I wanted all four of them to be powered. Just like the CB and Q set that you see out here, that's my motor power. All three of them are powered. Later on, we'll have a Western Pacific on the front, and all three of those are powered. So we purposely made all the locomotives powered. Now, there's also some confusion on ordering the locomotives. The CB and Q ran F3s in the beginning uh, to pull this train. The railroads figured they needed 4,500 horsepower to get the train over the road on time. 45 horsepower, 4,500 horsepower for the 12 cars that was going to be on the train. Now, three F units came out to exactly 4,500 horse because they were rated at 1,500 horsepower. So three times 15, there's your 4,500 horsepower. Now the Denver Rio Grande, they were unique. They added in another booster unit to their set. So they had an A, B, B, A. So they had four F3s on the front of the train because they had a torturous um, route that they traveled from Denver, Colorado all the way to Salt Lake City where they would hand the train off to Western Pacific. So they put four locomotives on the front. And oh, by the way, in the very beginning, they had Alco PAs on the front of it. And the Alcos were rated at 2,000 horsepower each. So they had 6,000 horsepower on the front of that train in the very beginning. Now the word is they had problems with the Alcos. A lot of historians say it was just the case. The railroad wasn't familiar with the four cycle engines in those Alcos. They were, were more predisposed to the EMD two cycle uh, power plants. So that's why they had problems with the Alcos, but nevertheless, the Alcos powered that train in an ABA configuration for about a year before the Denver Rio Grande went and purchased sets of F3s and later on F7s to power the train. And again, it was always four. Now the CB and Q, they powered the train in the beginning with three F3s, an A, B, A. So, so far you have an ABA, and then the Denver Rio Grande ABBA, and then the Western Pacific made it even more unique. They powered the train with an ABB. They had two boosters and just one cab control unit. Um, powered a train from uh, Salt Lake City on into Oakland, California, and then the people were ferried to uh, San Francisco. So the train would leave Chicago with an ABA on the front, 
it would go to Denver, Colorado, and oh, by the way, the films show all of this. The Chicago uh, and Burlington and Quincy would disconnect in Denver. The train would be put through a wash, a car wash. They show you all of that. It would be serviced. They'd look over the cars and make sure there's no problems. And then the Denver Rio Grande would back their locomotives onto it, and they would take the train out of Denver, which is already a mile high above sea level, and they would take it all the way to Salt Lake City, Utah. By the way, the train would reach a height of 9,239 feet, leaving um, uh, Denver going to Salt Lake City. So as you can see, not only did they have a torturous route to take the train, but it was also the air was much thinner, so they needed that extra horsepower to get the train over the route. Then when they got to Salt Lake City, they would take their power off, get it ready to power the eastbound train, and then the Western Pacific would put their power on and take it all the way into Oakland, California. And, and think about this for a moment. That partnership lasted for 21 years and two days. There's some marriages that don't last that long. I mean, think about it, three different railroads, and they made this train work for 21 years and two days. First inaugural run was March 20th, 1949. The last run was March 22nd, 1970. Now, you're gonna find in here, they goofed. They said it was 20 years and two days, but to do the math, it's 21 years and two days. So, okay, big deal. Um, but stunning. Now, the other stunning thing about the California Zephyr is there's a lot of premium passenger trains during the heyday of train travel in this country. You had the Broadway Limited. You had the 20th Century Limited. You had the um, Super Chief. You had the Chief. There are, there are a number of stunning trains out there, but there was only two trains that when their last day of service, they looked pretty much like they did in their youth. And one was the California Zephyr, meaning it didn't lose any of its cars in its 21-year lifespan. They didn't take the real flowers out of the vase, vases um, um, in the rooms in 21 years and two days. And the train was sparkling. I have a picture of it on its very last run, and it looked just like it did on the inaugural run. The only other train that kept that same level of service was the Santa Fe Super Chief. But the Super Chief actually merged two trains. They merged the El Capitan, which was the high-level cars, which today we call Superliners, uh, with the low-level uh, Super Chief cars. And then they had a transition car that smoothed in the transition from the high-level cars to the low-level cars. And again, Santa Fe management made sure that train was maintained to a very high standard to the very end. As a matter of fact, they gave Amtrak the name Super Chief, and when they saw what the service was, they took the name back and said, no, you cannot use the Super Chief in Amtrak service. And to this day, they don't. It's called the Southwest Chief. And only after like three years did they allow them to use um, the, South, the Chief in the name. Uh, but the California Zephyr went out just the way it basically looked from day one. So an amazing, amazing story. Um, the only other thing uh, is on the did you know section, that's another thing I'll send you. So if you buy the uh, Golden Flight Club set, I will send you 20 more amazing facts about this train. But let's just go over these five that I listed here. Did you know that there were three railroads partnered together to operate the California Zephyr from Chicago to San Francisco and that the partnership lasted 21 years and two days? Did you know that of the 77 cars purchased by the three railroads to form six train sets to meet the daily schedule of the California Zephyr, that none were lost to wreck damage and that most all are still in use today, 67 years after the last run? That the 10-6 sleeper car number 849, which was Silver Rapids, I've already explained that to you, gave you coast-to-coast -coast service and both the New York Central and the Pennsylvania Railroad used the car. Also, that after leaving Denver, Colorado, the Mile High City, the California Zephyr climbed through 46 tunnels, with the shortest being <laughs> 63 feet and the longest being the Moffitt Tunnel at over 6 miles in length. <clears throat> the train also reached a height of 9,000. I got 235 feet here, but some books say 239 feet. 
above sea level on the leg of trip on their leg of the trip to Salt Lake City, Utah. And that the California Zephyr was over eight hours late on its last trip because of protests. Uh, passengers and enthusiasts actually protested that th they knew the train was, that was the last day. They picketed at the uh, train stations throughout the last run. They had picket signs going, please don't stop this train. In actuality, you will read in this brochure here, Western Pacific had fallen into bad times financially. So they actually asked the ICC, which is a government arm, to annul their section of the train in 1967. And the government said, no, you got to keep running the train. They came back again in 1968. And the government said, no again, you got to keep running the train. Finally, in 1970, they granted the annulment, which ended the California Zephyr. Now, one of the reasons the government didn't give it to them in 1967, and again, this is a deeper dive and a deeper read in some of the books that are out there, the level of service was so high that people loved this train, and the government said, you got to keep running it because the service is, you know, it's at a fantastic level. What basically killed rail service in this country and don't get me wrong, every year my wife and I, we take a cross-country trip on Amtrak from uh, Washington, D.C. all the way to California. We get a room and we love it. It's just a civilized way to travel versus flying, especially now when they strip first you and you've got to take the shoes off and all the nonsense. Um, but what killed train travel in this country was, number one, the interstate highway system, which uh, Eisenhower uh, saw what was happening in World War II and how efficient the Autobahn was in Germany, he got Congress to give us the interstate highway system that you know today. So now you can take your personal wills, whether that was a station wagon or a sedan or a coupe or uh, your pickup truck and go from A to B at your leisure on very nice roads. The second thing that killed train travel in this country was the Boeing 707 or jet passenger travel. The 707, there was actually another jet that preceded it, but they had a horrible accident. It was an English train, or an English uh, plane. They had a horrible accident. It broke up in, in midair. But the Boeing 707 was the final death knell to train travel as we knew it in the heyday of uh, train travel in this country. So there you have the story of the California Zephyr.